<laughs> no, that's that's very much about what we're trying to do and make a difference in our community and, and not, again, like you said, just for the parents, but for the kids as well. For you guys to kind of get together on your own and, you know, for the kids who see this at home to have the guts to go up to maybe somebody you don't know or somebody you don't normally talk to and say, hey, like, you know, what's your name? What are you into? Like, get, get, kind of lose the click aspect, I think of it as you will. Um, but again, the hardest part is trying to get through the school districts and working in the community and gaining the support. So I think that's where we're at now. And again, mostly learning from parents, you know, I, I have a five-year-old, I have a small little one. So, you know, I'm in a whole different world. And right now we're working with middle school and high school students, but also eventually I think the elementary schools. I mean, it's, it's hard because they're young at that age and I have a child who is being bullied as a kindergartner right now in his school and it's tough because they don't know how to deal with it but and us as parents we have stress we go through every day we go through work we go through life and how do we not relay that stress on our kids too how do we make sure that we gain that balance so I think um, I think we're doing a good job and I think a lot of people are starting to see the light so happy things Jamie, just to follow up on what you said, um, I want to hand it over to Andy. Andy and uh, Andy, some of the things Jamie said about, you know, a young family dealing with a, such a young child dealing with bullying. What's some advice you could give to Jamie from from your experiences? Well, <clears throat> let me first say that I think the uh, fact that the community is coming together is really an important step because you know the schools have something now that was a law that was passed in 2012 called the Dignity for All Students Act. And, you know, without going into all the details, and I don't have all of them memorized, but essentially it says that the school has to pay attention to this, has to provide prevention and intervention and, and so forth. But, you know, you can't legislate sensitivity. And so without the community's involvement, I think a law like that really has no teeth. And so I really think that what you're doing is a step towards an answer of the question that Howie just asked me. Because by being involved and by taking a stand and being active around this issue, you're modeling something for your child, for your children. As far as a young child goes, I think, you know, we all live busy lives. We're very active. We have either you know two parents working or if it's a one parent household that parent is working and you know there's everything is scheduled there's not a moment for anything and so i think spending time alone with a child uh listening not just talking just listening and trying to get a sense of what's happening um, finding activities where the child is with other children where they feel a sense of belonging sense again of attachment and connectedness where they do feel accepted and worthwhile and have that feeling of competence there's something they're good at whether it's a sport or it's a scouts or or dance or whatever it might be i think those kind of things are really critical so uh, you know i think you're you're on the right track and being models is really a great step in the right direction Steve, you want to add something to that? Sure. I think when we're talking about the issue, we have to talk about going forward and moving forward. Um, I think it was just recently they passed uh, legislation or a law, uh, whereas the schools are now responsible to um, take care and be accountable for kids with ADHD and ADD. And that's something that's been around forever, but they weren't responsible for that. There are kids that we have mentioned, and there are adults, but we're talking to school at this point, and certainly there are kids with the tendencies to depression, tendencies to be sad, tendencies to be not involved in what's going on, tendencies um, to, um, I, I guess, have anxiety, the question is how we're gonna be able and who will be the informant to be able to pass that information on so that information could be used. Um, you know, hopefully the teachers will get involved. 
hopefully, as you said, as parents, you're gonna get involved. And, and by doing so, we can hopefully pay attention to the person, the kid who needs it at that point. That's what's going on is there are people that are going through that, there are kids that are going through that, and there are stories that kids could tell you today from people that are in the room and have experienced going through bullying. And I guess they felt they had, they had no one to go to. And, and that's the problem, you know? They need to be comfortable with who they're going to. They may be comfortable with the parent, they may not be comfortable. They may be comfortable with the parish, they may not. We have to give them as many outlets as we can till we find the one that they're comfortable with. Whether it be a mentor, whether it be a teacher, a parent, we don't want to make them uncomfortable or have them withdraw from that s scenario because that's the worst thing. We want them to have a place where they can get help unconditionally, also unquestioned, and know 100% that it's not going to be discussed among other students. That's as important as anything, that it be confidential. If it's confidential, that's going to be the key. And I, I think that's the worry of the kids, that they go up and it gets out and social media spreads that within seconds, and that's not what they want. So when you're doing this, I think confidentiality has to be a key. If they're gonna talk to somebody, it has to, it has to stop there. Okay, um, Lena, one